a very uh, good morning is it a very good morning to everyone here in the hall and uh, recently uh, if you all remember there was this uh, little class one hour class in the morning how to make a presentation so i tried to pick up some uh, some uh, tips from there so that's how i created this uh, <laughs> This, this was after listening to Arohi. Arohi was the one who spoke, no? Arohi when, uh, was speaking on paper, poster presentation. Okay, so this may PPT, how to make a PPT. But I'm sorry, I've not been able to keep to those six lines. I tried my level best. So uh, this topic is uh, not such a dynamic topic, topic, so to say, like we listen to people in the morning, the speakers, uh, there was so much of discussion, there was so much food for thought. So I'm going to share facts with you, certain facts of which we are oblivious. We treat milk as, well, uh, biofluid to provide nutrition to babies, but it's actually much more than that. So uh, we're going to talk about how milk is produced, what is the composition, and what are the functions that it has to uh, provide. So human milk, needless to say, is a masterpiece of nutrition. Uh, it's highly specialized and variable biofuel. Like the composition changes from the diurnal variation plus from baby to baby. If it's a preterm baby, the composition is going to be different. If it's a term baby, it's going to be different. If the mother is eating some sort of food, there might be some changes in some of the micronutrients in the uh, content of the milk. It's very sophisticated nutrient and communication system. So did we ever, do we realize that it's a communication system between the mother and the neonate, which is orchestrating early programming of the infant? I didn't think of milk like that till I sat down and made this presentation. So it's actually orchestrating early programming of the infant. We'll see how. It influences uh, gene expression in the baby. We know that genes can be changed according to epigenetic mechanisms. So there are several uh, ingredients in human milk which have an influence on the genetics of the baby. And these influences are heritable. So they could be permanent uh, influence. So that's why you know some people don't like to share milk with other children, other babies, because then they feel that they'll be sibling um, what do you say, milk sibling. And if they were to marry, then maybe those genetic things, just like consanguineous marriages, would multiply. So the gut, we should remember, is the largest interface of the host, which is exposed to extraneous environment. And the neonatal gut is a very immature one. So it is liable to a lot of insult. Human milk provides nutrition, is trophic, enhances immunity, regulates inflammation, and sets up a healthy gut microbiome. So all that is happening uh, to baby's guts who are being fed with human milk. So let's talk about the factory where this special biofluid is being made. So the mammary gland, they have these lactosites. And as you can see, there are so many channels, ion channels. It's a very specialized factory. And it is regulated by certain genes. So these genes, they may be upregulated or downregulated during different stages of lactation. And that affects the functioning of this factory. There are two hormones which are responsible for the proper functioning of this factory. We know prolactin, which causes production of milk, and oxytocin, which brings about ejection of milk. The milk that is produced in this fantastic factory has nutritive components and, more importantly, bioactive components. All of us seem to know lipids, proteins, fats. But many of us are oblivious of the bioactive components. And that's why, you know, like sharing milk was being considered. So if you're sharing milk, all these bio 
active components would be there and if infections you can take care of, then the advantages of these bioactive components, some of them will not be there in formula milk. And we will see how important these bioactive substances are. So bioactive substances like human uh, milk oligosaccharides, vitamins, minerals, cells, cytokines, which promote inflammation as well as those which inhibit inflammation. Micro RNA, micro RNA, because we said that it has epigenetic influences. Micro RNA from the mother going across to the baby through milk. Immunoglobulin, growth factors, hormones, antimicrobials, nuisance, and microbiota. The microbiota also transmitted are they are present naturally in milk. So all these things are there as bioactive components of milk. So there are stages of breast milk. We have colostrum, which is the secretion in the first five days. Then we have transitional milk for the next three weeks or so. And then mature milk after 20 days. The composition of, this, of these three stages of milk is quite different because the purpose that they have to serve is different. Now, this cannot be so in a patient, who, in a baby who is being fed on uh, formula milk. The composition is going to be the same. It will not change with time. But the requirement of the baby is changing with time. So, in the first few days when the mother is producing colostrum, the, this biofluid, it, its main purpose is to increase the immunity in the baby. Its main purpose is to take care of any infections in the baby. And it's a trophic fluid. So growth of the immature gut. So the main function of colostrum is that it provides trophic influences to the gut and it helps the baby, baby's immunity. And not to provide nutrition so much. So if we were to check this, the energy content is much less than in mature milk. But the total protein content is more. Lactoferrin is much more, almost three, two and a half. Secretory immunoglobulins and all immunoglobulin A levels are much higher. So immunogenic properties. HMOs, human milk oligosaccharides, are almost two times that in mature milk. So clearly, this is such a factory that is producing things according to the needs of the baby. And we know that the needs are very different. So if we were to talk about the macronutrients in mature milk, we'll talk only very shortly about them because we've been learning about them ever since we have been uh, undergraduates. So the largest part of milk is made up of carbohydrates, lactose. Second one is lipids. And the third most abundant is oligosaccharides. If we were to compare this with bovine milk, we would see that lactose content is much more than in bovine milk. But protein content in bovine milk is more than in mother's milk. This is because more lactose is required for brain growth, while the bovine calf needs more proteins to grow bigger in size. So let's talk about human milk oligosaccharides. There are a whole more than uh, 200 oligosaccharides have been uh, detected in human milk and we shall talk shortly about it. So this HMO, as it is called in short, these are non-digestible. They are non-nutritional carbohydrates. They are synthesized by the lactosides. 200 HMOs have been identified to now. And the two most abundant and most important ones are 2-FL, 2-FL and L-N-N-T. Both of these can also be synthesized in the industry. So many people are coming out with formula milk which already has these uh, HMOs at a very high cost. The cost is almost double of routine milk formula. Then these are not affected by pasteurization. That's another thing. Otherwise, pasteurization, Dr. Sushma will be talking to us about that tomorrow, I think. That destroys so many things in 
in uh, milk. But these human milk oligosaccharides, they are resistant to pasteurization. And you will be amazed to know that 10% of the 100 calories that a lactating woman burns every day to synthesize milk are spent in synthesizing these human milk oligosaccharides. That is a large amount. So then there must be something special that these HMOs are doing. They are ni neither nutritive, they are non-digested. Then why is the poor neonate spending, uh, I mean, why are so many calories being spent on manufacturing these? So there must be something which is of high relevance. And let us see what those things are. So we will only very briefly talk about the structure of HMOs. The core of the HMO is made up of lactose, which means that there is one molecule of galactose and there is one of glucose. This is the central core. To this central core, several other monosaccharides can be attached. These could be glucose, these could be galactose, FUCN short, N acetyl glucosamine, and N acetyl neuraminic acid. So these are linked to the central core at different sites. Not going into great details of it, but little bit we have to know, otherwise, we'll not probably understand what's happening. So here these are so many. So many different, we said that 200 have been detected already. So these are fucosylated ones. So here we know that this one is fucose. If fucose is attached to the central core, these are known as fucosylated oligosaccharides. Then these are the ones which are silated oligosaccharides because here is sialic acid. If that is attached, then this is sialic, uh, silated oligosaccharides. And these are neutral. They don't have fucose and they don't have any acidic component in them. So the most talked about uh, HMOs out of all these are 2FN, which is a fucosylated HMO, and LNNT, which is a neutral oligosaccharide. So just to simplify the thing, we have neutral HMOs and we have acidic HMOs. The neutral HMOs make up more than 75% of the total HMOs in milk. And the important ones are 2FL and LNNT. And this acidic one is also there. But the two most important ones are these. And these are the ones that can be synthesized in the factories also. So they, they can be added to human milk, to human milk formula at a big cost. And here it is coming for free. Now, factors affecting HMO composition and concentration. Now, who decides that which mother will produce milk which has got more 2FL, which uh, mother will produce milk which has got more LNNT? How will that be decided? So that is decided based on certain genetic factors in the mother. So mothers may be secretors if they have the secretor gene, and they may be Lewis antigen positive. Okay, some mother will be secretor gene positive as well as this Lewis uh, antigen posit gene positive. This secretor gene causes production of 2FL, while this Lewis, uh, Lewis uh, gene that is responsible for. Uh, the presence of this uh, enzyme, which causes production of LNNT. Okay, so we have the two most important HMOs. This one is 2FL and this one is LNNT. And depending upon what is the genetic status of the mother, the mother will produce, either she will produce both of these HMOs or if she is secretor gene negative, she won't produce 2FN, she will only produce. If she is secretor gene positive, but Lewis gene, uh, Lewis gene negative, then she will only produce uh, this one, 2FN. And if she doesn't have genes for uh, the secretory gene as well as the Lewis gene, then she will neither produce 2FN nor will she produce any LNNT. So this is 
uh, orchestrated by the genetic makeup of the mother. Then there are certain other factors. For example, the parity, the body mass index of the mother, the genetic location, ethnicity, and the phase of lactation. So as the phase of lactation changes, the composition of uh, these um, 2FL and the concentration percentage of 2FL and LNNTs will also change. So what do these HMOs do? First and foremost, it's important to realize that they establish a protective gut microbiota and they also trap pathogens. So we said that the neonatal gut is an immature one. So it has to be uh, filled with protective bacteria. So this HMO helps with that. Here you can see that in case HMO is not there, and this is the case where HMO is present in the milk. So in the presence of HMOs, the bacteria, the, the good healthy bacteria, the blue ones, they are definitely more than the pathogens, which are the red ones. HMOs also serve as decoys for pathogens. Now here, this is the epithelium, the gut epithelium, and this is a glycan in the, uh, in the gut epithelium. So this is like a receptor in the epithelium, in the baby's epithelium. Here comes a pathogen. Pathogen has MAMPs, that is ligands on its surface, which can nicely fit into this. And then after, thereafter, this pathogen enters into the cell and it starts inflammation and problems. So if there is no HMO, the pathogen will get, will attach to the glycan, which is a ligand of the uh, this thing, which is a receptor protein of the epithelium, and it will cause destruction and inflammation. However, if there is HMO, and this is the molecule HMO, then the HMO can, this uh, bacteria, this uh, HMO will act as a decoy for the pathogen. So the pathogen gets attached to the HMO and not to the glycan, which is on the epithelial surface of the gut. Hence, it is protecting the gut from invasion by um, pathogens as well as it is increasing the commensals, the beneficial uh, bacteria in the gut. Now, talking about the gut, gut barrier function, we also have this picture here. That here, when there is no HMO, then we have seen that this is the glycan of the epithelium of the neonate. And because there is no HMO, so it is that this pathogen is uh, attaching, the ligand is attaching to this receptor, the uh, glycan. But in the presence of HMO, this HMO is causing differentiation and gene expression differential gene expression inside the gut epithelium so that it is altering glycan expression. So if the glycan is altered, then that glycan will not be, this pathogen will not be able to attach to this glycan. The HMO is, has got epigenetic properties. It is entering the cell. It is affecting the differential gene ex expression. It is altering the glycan expression. And it is also bringing about certain changes in the cell cycle so that uh, proliferation and apoptosis and differentiation of the gut epithelium also changes. It, uh, these HMOs also act as immune modulators. Here you can see that when there are no HMOs, then the T helper cell 1 and T helper cell 2, fun, uh, uh, they are, the responses are not equal. But in the presence of HMO, there is a more stabilized uh, T helper cell 1 and T helper cell 2 concentration. So this will decrease uh, inflammation and this is how HMOs are acting as immune modulators. Immunological functions of HMO, if you look at this picture, we see that the bacteria which are there in the intestinal lumen they are shut off, the commensals are propagating, and the glycans are also affected, and so this pathogen cannot attach to the surface of the epithelium. Here, when there are no uh, HMO in the milk, 
the pro-inflammatory cytokines are increased while here when HMOs are present, then pro-inflammatory cytokines are decreased and there are balanced T1 and T2 responses and the B cells are also propagating and a lot of uh, IgA is being produced. HMO also affects the brain and the nervous system, enteric nervous system. So 2FL specially is, uh, is the one that is responsible for this. It improves cognition, learning and memory. So that was all about HMOs and we realized how important they are and we have probably not heard about them or just heard about them and not really know how they work. Another very fascinating thing I found was this milk fat globule. We know that lipids are a huge part of the mother's milk and uh, fat is, is uh, secreted as fat globules from the mammary gland. And this is the diagram of a milk fat globule. And this is the complicated membrane that this fat globule has made up of all phospholipids of various kinds of written names here. I can hardly pronounce it. And the central core has triacyl glycerols. So these phospholipids, these are amazing phospholipids. And these are all the functions that they have. Antibacterial properties, they regulate lipid secretion, T cell proliferation, cell development, integrity, brain development, intestinal mucosal barrier function. They regulate immune cells. We all know that sphingomyelin is so important for brain development and function. And lactoderin. MUC1 for gut immunity, digestive enzymes, resistance and function, induction of anti-inflammatory responses, protective against rotavirus species, salmonella, E. coli, pseudomonas. So this is the amazing structure of the fat globule. And these are all the things that this membrane, the milk fat globule membrane can do. Another amazing component of human milk is the microRNA content. I didn't notice till a few weeks back that there were microRNA in milk. And this is when this topic was allocated to me that I got to know about it. And it's just fascinating. So these microRNAs, they are epigenetic regulators. See how. And this is a cell, mammary uh, gland cell, or lactocyte. And this microRNA, this is the nucleus, this is the cytoplasm. And here is the DNA of the nucleus. And here we are, they are making microRNA. You have primary microRNA, and then you have uh, this pre-microRNA, and then these are getting uh, en entrapped in uh, vesicles, and these micro vesicles and apoptotic bodies, and these exosomes filled with uh, this cargo of microRNA and this is RNA binding protein. These are all having these small, small microRNAs. All these things, they travel to the baby and then they affect the nucleus of the cells of the baby. So this microRNA, you know, can is carrying DNA material, genetic material to the baby. And it can have epigenetic influences on the, on the genes of the baby. So if you just want to look at this, the nucleus. So here, this is the, the primary microRNA from which by the action of this dosha complex, this thing is made by splicing some part of it. This is a hairpin structure, pre microRNA. It's out of the nucleus into the cytoplasm. And then further dicing or splicing of this occurs and you get a micro RNA duplex. Here you can see two. And then the risk complex adds on it. This is a silencer complex. And then you get mature micro RNA, which we saw in the other picture, which comes out as exosomes and uh, uh, those vesicles and it can get, get attached to uh, the, phospholip the lipids in the mother's blood. Yeah. So this is again the same thing. This is showing us that in the maternal uh, epithelial cells, this microRNA is being made and it comes out. It goes to the gut of the baby where it is producing a lot of changes. This DMT 
DNMT uh, transferase, which acts on DNA, is affected. And it can then get into the systemic circulation. And some of it also travels through the tight junction between the intestinal cells and reaches the vascular compartment of the baby. Amazing. Next, we come to human milk microbiome. So, human milk naturally also has bacteria. Mother's milk. So, if you are going to boil that milk, these bacteria are going to die. But other properties are going to remain. Hormones are not going to get destroyed, for example. But then, it's important to realize that by almost 200 species of 50 different genera have been found from mother's milk itself. Full maturation of human milk microbiota occurs by one month of life. Which are the common organisms? Staphylococcus, streptococcus, and lactic acid and anaerobic bacteria. Even anaerobic bacteria. These play a variety of anti-infectious immunomodulated, um, uh, immunomodulatory and metabolic roles. But the question is, ki, from where did they come? How come mother's milk is, is rich with microbiomes? Kahan se gaya? What is the mechanism? So here is the mechanism. So this is the mother. This is her gut. So from the gut, the gut is loaded with bacteria. These microbiomes they are taken up, the gut bacteria, by these dendritic cells from the gut. And then they go to the lymph nodes. and then through the lymph and the blood, they reach the mammary gland epithelium, where again, with the help of these dendritic cells, they go into the, they are secreted into the milk. And this milk microbiota hence comes to the baby. Huh. And this is one mechanism, the, the maternal enteric mechanism. And the other one is that some of backflow from the baby's mouth into the mother's system. The baby's mouth oral cavity is uh, has many bacteria, commensals. So those commensals can travel from in a retrograde way from the infant to the mother. So those can also be part of the uh, microbiome that one finds in uh, human milk. Then we have certain other bioactive components of breast milk, cells, macrophages, which protect against infection, T cell activation, stem cells, which we all know are important for regeneration and repair, a whole lot of immunoglobulins, the chief one being the secretory IgA, and pathogen binding inhibition, and antimicrobial activity, IgM causes agglutination and complement activation. Then cytokines. We have pro-inflammatory as well as anti-inflammatory uh, cytokines in milk. And uh, this interleukin 6, 7, 8, 10, interferon, EGF, beta, and tumor necrosis factor alpha. And they are also doing having very specialized functions. And uh, like they stimulate acute, uh, acute phase responses. They are pro-inflammatory. This causes increased thymic size and output. These recruit neutrophils and they are pro-inflammatory. Then there are these interleukin-10, which has, which represses um, these helper cell one type inflammation. And it causes production of antibody. That facilitates tolerance. Interleukin, uh, interferon uh, causes pro is pro-inflammatory and stimulates uh, T, uh, this thing, T helper cell one response and TGF beta is anti inflammatory. And uh, this thing, tumor necrosis factor stimulates inflammatory immune reaction. So there is a whole uh, mixture of things pro inflammatory as well as uh, those that suppress inflammation. These are very important when one thinks of necrotizing enterobolic. So babies may who are not fed on mother's milk may get necrotize are more liable to get necrotizing uh, enterocolitis because of a deficiency of this cytokine. 
And if there is an overplay of the cytokine of the inflammatory cytokines, then that could lead to the, the development of NEC. Okay. So growth factors are epidermal growth factors, apparent bound epithelial growth, growth factor, vascular endothelial growth factor. We are all we all know this VEGF, neuronal growth factor, insulin-like growth factors, erythropoietin. And we know the function of most of these. They are, it is um, generally to stimulate cell proliferation and maturation. Then there are certain, certain other components, antimicrobials, primarily lactoferrin. It's an acute phase protein. It chelates iron. So organisms like E. coli would be suppressed. It's antibacterial and antioxidant. Then we have lact adherent, which has got antiviral uh, properties and prevents inflammation by enhancing apoptosis and phagocy uh, phagocytosis of apoptotic cells. HMOs we've already talked at length about, and then mucins, they block infection by viruses and bacteria. There are certain hormones in milk, adiporlectin, leptin, ghrelin, calcitonin, and somatostatin. And all of them, they have important functions. Now, if we were to put everything together in one slide, I'd like to talk about the factors in breast milk which regulate intestinal inflammation. So we have microbial factors, we have immunological factors and metabolic factors. Human milk, oligosaccharide, lysozyme, lactoferrin, lact adherin, antioxidants, Antiproteases, leptin, adeno, adeno, adipo, adiponectin, omega 3, UFAR, and the like. So, thank you very much. <laughs>